Hello, everybody, and welcome to Rightly Dividing the Word with R.K. Brown. I am R.K. Brown, and I am the adult Sunday school teacher and Wednesday night Bible teacher at Fatherland Baptist Church in Madison, Tennessee. Y'all come visit us. We'd love to have you. Tonight, I had an idea that I was going to do a lesson that I actually put together a good while back called Lions. And I thought I had put it in my scene collections in OBS. I don't know. <laughs> you gamers out there will know what I'm talking about. And uh, anyway, so I, I put it in my scene collection in OBS, but it doesn't seem to be there. So I'll just say this. I'm pretty sure I put it in there. I'm almost certain that I put it in there. But it doesn't seem to be there. So I decided I am going to preach the gospel tonight. Because there's nothing more important than for people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody's online. Hello, whoever you are. I, obviously, if you know me, you know I can't see very well, so I can't tell who you are. But I uh, flipped over and I saw that there's that green thing that has your name in it. So hello, whoever you are. It could be my mom even. I don't know. But anyway, I am going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ tonight. There's nothing more important than the gospel. We live in... A.D. 2019. Now, what that means is A.D. means Anno Domini or year of our Lord. Time is measured around the world, even if the Chinese have their own years, even if the Hebrews have their own years or the Jews now, as they call themselves, even if they have their own years. The world measures time by Jesus Christ. Jesus divided time and at his birth, approximately, not exactly, but approximately, because the calendars have been messed with a little bit, so there's a three or four years off, maybe. But 2,019 years ago, approximately, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, was born in the city of David, which is Bethlehem, to a virgin named Mary, who was espoused to a man named Joseph. And that man grew up and lived a perfectly sinless life and died on a cross and shed his blood. Now, the preacher John MacArthur will tell you, well, it's not so much the blood of Christ that's important, but the death of Christ. Well, no, it's the blood of Christ because the Bible, like, for instance, in, in, he in the book of Hebrews, I think in chapter 8, it says, without the shedding of blood is no remission. Jesus Christ shed his blood for our sins. So I'm going to go through basically what might be called the plan of salvation. I'm going to tell you if you are not a Christian tonight, I'm speaking to you specifically. I'm going to tell you how you can be saved. Now, a few weeks ago, I did a teaching called Soul Winning Scripture. I actually did two teachings, one called Soul Winning, the first works, where I showed that I believe that the first works are that we go out and preach the gospel because after Jesus was crucified and he met with his apostles, he sent them out, and it's recorded in all four gospels and in the book of Acts. He sent them out to preach the gospel to the world. It's called the Great Commission. Now, it's mostly talked about in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, but it is in, in Mark chapter 16, John, I believe, chapter 21, where Jesus tells Peter, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And it's in the book of, it's in Luke 24, it's in the book of Acts, chapter 1. And, of course, we see them in the book of Acts going out and preaching the gospel, doing the very thing that I'm going to do tonight. Only, I'm sitting in the comfort of a living room, and they are, they were walking everywhere they went, endangering their lives. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you'll see just what Paul went through to get the gospel message out, and his work is still being just poured over today by every kind of person that studies the Bible. So their work mattered. We live in the year 2019 because Jesus Christ was born approximately 2019 years ago. Now, the Jews don't want to acknowledge B.C. and A.D. They don't want to acknowledge before Christ or Anno Domini, so what they do is they call it BCE, or Before Common Era, or CE, Common Era. But by doing that very thing, they acknowledge that they're forced to acknowledge that Christ was born at that time, even if they don't want to believe it. They are forced into it. 
Jesus Christ turned the world upside down. Jesus Christ divided time between B.C. and A.D. This that I'm about to tell you today is the most important thing that anybody has or will ever tell you in your entire life. There is nothing more important than this. Because if you don't believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't put your trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then God will send you to hell. And you will pay for your own sins. But the Bible tells us that Jesus took upon us, I'm sorry, that Jesus took upon himself our sins, that he paid our sin debt that we could not pay. He lived a perfectly sinless life, and he paid our sin debt. So I'm going to tell you, if you're willing to hear it, how you can be saved. Now, I'm going to start with this. Jesus told his apostles and his disciples in Matthew 9, verse 37, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The world is the harvest. According to Matthew chapter 13, the world, the end of the world is the harvest, or when the harvest is going to be reaped. Jesus said, pray to the Lord that he will send labors into his harvest. So I am going out into the harvest. Right now, I'm going out into the field, and I'm going to throw the seed of the word of God into the field. And I Hope that if you are listening to this live, which I think only one person is on, or if you hear this later on the Internet, on Facebook or YouTube or wherever else it might end up, I am talking to you if you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are a believer, then watch this and write down all these scriptures so that you can use these scriptures to minister to people. Now, it's funny. I'm just going to reach over here on my drum. I have drums in my living room because actually what you see behind me is not my actual living room. <laughs> what you see behind you is uh, uh, what you see behind me is a green screen thing. Y'all check this out. I never do this, but y'all check this out. I'm going to do this today because why not? <laughs> this is my orange walled living room that I sit in when I when I preach the gospel. So I never do this, but <laughs> you see all my stuff back there, all my instruments and, you know, my drum machine controller and all that stuff. So obviously it looks terrible with my orange walls. So I sit behind a green screen like this. <laughs> so it's just more pleasant to look upon. Anyway, as I was reaching over there, it just occurred to me to do that. Not too long ago, some kids knocked on my door, and when I opened the door, they handed me this. And actually, it turns out that I knew the guy that they were going out soul winning with because when they knocked on the door, they just put that in my hand. And I said, I looked at it and I said, aren't you going to evangelize me? And the kid said, uh, if you want me to, but I, I see you talking to Mr. Walford all the time. And I'm like, oh, OK, I know who y'all are. I know where y'all are from now. OK, well, so I laughed. And But anyway, so he gave me this thing here. And on the other side is soul winning scripture. It's pretty cool. So I'm going to present to you something like this, only it's going to be in greater detail. So without further ado, here we go. Romans chapter 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. There's not anybody that hasn't sinned. Let me give you some more scripture to back that up. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. 1 John 1 verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Ecclesiastes 7.20, for there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. So that there's a lot of scripture there, and there's obviously there's more scripture, but that is a lot of scripture there to tell you that there is nobody on earth except for Jesus Christ that has not sinned. We are all sinners. And given the fact that we are all sinners, we have a problem. We have a serious problem because the Bible tells us that the for the wages of sin in Romans 6:23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. 
Now, the part I want to focus on mainly right there is that the wages of sin is death. Now, obviously, we're going to talk about the fact that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ in a little bit. But I want to zero in. I want to zone in on this part right now about the wages of sin being death. Because every one of us is going to die. Romans chapter 5 tells us that that death entered into the world and that all die because that all have sinned. So we're all sinners. Now, obviously, babies are not held accountable for their sinfulness. But we all sin. Everybody can die, including a baby. Everybody can die. So that means that we have all sinned. We're all sinners. Now, obviously, like I said, a baby doesn't know to choose the good and to choose the evil. So God doesn't hold them accountable. But we're all sinners. We're all born with a sin nature. Now, what I'm not saying... I'm not teaching the Catholic, the Roman Catholic doctrine that we're all guilty of Adam's sin. The Bible, in, in the creation story, in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible, you know, tells us that when God created the animals and the, you know, the creeping things and the fish and the fowl and all that kind of stuff, that everything brought forth after its own kind. Well, when Adam became a sinner, then from that point, he also brought forth after his own kind, and his own kind is sinners. So we're all born being sinners. Not that we're guilty of the original sin, as the Roman Catholics would say, but that we're all sinners because everything brings forth after its own kind. Now, the wages of sin is death. And like I said, we all know that we're going to die, every one of us, unless we happen to be among those that are alive and remain unto the coming of Christ, are going to die. However, it's not just physical death that we're concerned about because the Bible talks about something called the second death. The Bible says in Revelation 20, verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, then you are headed for the lake of fire. Well, you might say to yourself at this point, R.K., okay, man, I'm not that bad of a guy. I'm a pretty good guy, man. I don't steal. I certainly ain't never killed nobody. I don't, I don't, I don't even sleep around. I'm not, a, I'm not a whore or a whoremonger. I don't do those things. I'm, I'm a pretty good person. But you have lied. I have lied and you have lied. We have a problem. And the problem is this. Revelation 21, verse 8, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers, now you may not be any of those, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So the wages of sin is death, but it's not just physical death. It's the second death, which is hell fire, which is to be cast into the lake of fire and all liars will find their place there. I have certainly lied. Even as a Christian, I have lied. And if you're a Christian, you know you have too. You know, if you're watching this either now or in the future, this is, I don't even know what date we're looking at, January 27th, maybe, in 2019. Sunday, January 27th, maybe. If you're looking at this in the future, you have lied. You know you have. So you are staring face-to-face -face with, face-to-face -face not only with physical death, but you're staring face-to-face -face with the second death. However, there is a remedy for our sin. Romans 5, 8 tells us, But God commendeth his love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm about to tell you about the gospel in a minute. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He, the Bible says that Jesus became sin on the cross that he became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That because Jesus lived a perfectly sinless life and went to the cross and died for us, we 
can become the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. And this is the gospel. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, I believe that when he was buried, his soul went down to hell. His soul went down to the lower parts of the earth. His body stayed up in the upper parts of the earth in the grave. But his soul went down to hell. He paid for our sins. That's the reason there's a burnt sacrifice in the Old Testament. Jesus was always a picture of the sacrifice, and it's a burnt offering for sin. Because Jesus had to be burned. He went to hell and he stayed there for three days and three nights. No wonder he was sweating drops of sweat like they were drops of blood, like big old huge drops of sweat because he knew what was coming to him, not just the death on the cross. Now, some people will say, well, Jesus said it is finished. Well, he finished the work on earth. He did all the miracles. He preached the gospel to its fullest and he went to the cross and was crucified. He finished that work. But he, that's not it. That Jesus died for your sins is not enough. He also had to be raised for your justification. The Bible said that Christ died for our sins and was raised for our justification. And the fact that he was raised from the dead is the proof that not only did God raise him from the dead, but God will also raise you from the dead because you believe that yet though, though he were dead, yet shall he live. We will never we who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ will never taste death. We will never know death for one second. We will immediately, when our physical eyes shut, immediately our soul goes to heaven awaiting the resurrection of our bodies. Some, a lot of theologians call that the intermediate state, and it is true. It is a true thing. I don't believe in soul sleep. I believe that our souls go immediately to be with the Lord in heaven, waiting for the redemption of our bodies. Romans chapter 8, verse 9, maybe. Anyway, the gospel is that Jesus Christ, who lived a perfectly sinless life, committed no sin. He that knew no sin became sin for us. He became sin on that cross, died, shed his blood for you and for me that we might become the righteousness of God, that we might be declared righteous, even though we are wicked people, even though we are sinners. And you, if you look at yourself honestly, you can know that you are a sinner. Jesus Christ died, was buried. His soul went down to the lower parts of the earth. His body, you know, as it says in Acts chapter 2, that his body was not left in the grave and neither was his soul left in hell. His soul went down to hell. So, God raised him on the third day, guaranteeing, like I said before, guaranteeing that he will raise us up who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This question was asked once in the Bible in this most direct way. Before I tell, I'm just going to say that Paul and Silas, his friend and his, his colleague in the gospel, were put in prison in, in a city called Philippi. And while they were there, they were put in the stocks and they, well, they had been beaten and then they were put in the stocks and at midnight they were singing hymns and there came an earthquake and shook open the prison doors and the prison guard saw that the prison doors were open. He was asleep and when he woke up, he saw the prison doors were open and he took his sword and was about to kill himself, probably thinking the Roman soldiers would do to me a lot worse than what I could do to myself just by running myself through with this sword. You know, they'll put me on a cross or something. So, so he, uh, he was about to kill himself, and the apostle Paul yelled out to him and said, Do thyself no harm, we are all here. And he runs in, trembling into the cell with a light, and says this, and brought him out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, they didn't say, turn over a new leaf. They didn't say, live a good life. They didn't say, keep all the commandments of God. They said this, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in all thy house. Now, of course, the Apostle Paul 
went and preached. Actually, the man took them to his house and cleaned up their wounds, and he preached. Paul and Silas preached to their whole family, and all of them were saved. So when Paul said to that man, if you believe, then you'll be saved and your house, well, that actually happened to that man. That doesn't happen in every household. That doesn't guarantee that everybody in your house is going to be saved. You need to preach the gospel to the people in your house and try to get them saved if you're a believer. You need to be telling them the scripture that I'm telling you so that they can be saved. All right? So they didn't say turn over a new leaf. They didn't say clean up your life and come to God. They said believe on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is what saves us, not turning over a new leaf, not living a good life. There is nothing you can do that's good enough to save yourself. The Bible says that our, in Isaiah, I think in chapter 61, either 61 or 63, I can't remember right now, the Bible tells us that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And from my understanding, what that means is a menstrual cloth. I know it's disgusting, but that's how disgusting the best we have to offer to God is like a menstrual cloth. It's just filthy. It's nasty. Not anything you'd even want to touch, and God don't want to touch it. So he shed the blood of his own only begotten son that we could be saved, and he raised him from the dead, proving that Jesus died for our sins. He raised him from the dead, guaranteeing that he will also raise us from the dead. I know I've said it a thousand times, but I don't think it can be said too much. I want to make sure you understand because I don't have the opportunity to say to you at the end of this thing, well, okay, do you understand? Say it back to me. So I want to make sure that you understand. So he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. The Bible says it like this. Believe, believe, believe. This is what I, this is what I'm teaching. John 3, 16, the most famous verse in the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It didn't say whoever lives a good life, whoever turns over a new leaf, whoever keeps all the commandments of God. It says whoever believes, because we are carrying around this dead man, which is our flesh, that can't do anything that's pleasing to God. Only faith is pleasing to God. Um, how does how does the Bible say it uh, in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11? I believe it's verse 4, that without faith it's impossible to please him. In order to please him, you must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You must believe the gospel in order to please the Lord, in order to please God. You have to believe on his son, Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. Now, jump down. Jump over verse 17 down to verse 18 of John chapter 3, and it says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So whoever believes is not condemned because we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever does not believe is condemned already ready. It's not like at some point you're going to be condemned. You are already condemned. And if you die not believing, you are going to have to pay for your own sin because you didn't believe the gospel and accept the free gift of salvation that comes to you through the blood of Jesus Christ. So we must believe, believe, believe. Salvation is a free gift. So once we believe in salvation, then I want to tell you something. God is not going to take that gift from you. Remember I showed you the scripture up here that said, uh, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Well, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says this, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, let's say that I, let me pull up something here. I got these headphones right here in my, in my recording studio. These are pretty nice headphones here. These are isolation headphones. Good for drummers and, you know, good for vocals so you don't get microphone bleeding, all that kind of stuff. Now, suppose I say to you, man, I'll give you these headphones. These are, you know, $100 on sale. I'll give you these headphones 
for $10. Well, even if I'm giving you a great discount, it's still not free, right? It's not a gift. I'm selling them to you. So what if I say to you, I'll give you these headphones, but you got to come over and clean up my house. Is that a gift? No, that's not a gift. That is you working for these headphones. So that's not a gift. Or suppose I tell you, well, I'm going to give you these headphones, and I give them to you, but I come back a couple of weeks later and say, hey, uh, i got to have these headphones back. Was that a gift? No, because I took it back. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The Bible said it is by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The salvation of Jesus Christ is free. Jesus paid for it. It wasn't free for him. He paid a heavy price for it because he was nailed to a cross. He had nails driven through his hands and feet. And he basically just kind of, you know, sort of suffocated to death from what I understand. But they also drew blood from his hands and his feet with the nails. And then not only that, but after he died, a Roman soldier came and thrust a sword into his side and poured out his blood the blood and water poured out of his side. So his blood was shed for our sins. He paid a heavy price. And then his soul, his body went to the grave, but his soul went down to hell. He paid a heavy price for your salvation and mine. And we need only put our trust. When I say believe, I don't mean just believe as a bunch of facts. I mean commit your trust to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that Jesus has your back, that he has delivered you from yourself, from your sin. Put your trust in Jesus Christ, and he will save you. He will never take that gift away. It's a free gift. You didn't have to pay for it. He did. You didn't have to work for it. He did the work on the cross, and he's never going to take it back because it's a gift. It's a free gift. The Bible says it like this in Romans 3.24 being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. We are justified freely. Salvation is a free gift. And the Bible tells us that salvation is eternal. Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God cannot lie. If God says something, it comes to pass. He cannot lie. He promised us that if we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we put our trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we will be saved. He cannot lie. And we look forward to eternal life. John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hands. No man, including yourself. You're not going to pluck yourself even out of his hands. No man. And you are a man, right? Even if you're a, a woman, you're, you know, you're part of mankind. No man is able to pluck them out of my hands. You can't even pluck yourself out of his hands. You have eternal security the gift of God is eternal life. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. They shall never perish. John 2.25, and this, I'm sorry, 1 John 2.25, and this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. And remember, he can't lie. He promised us that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he can't lie. He's going to give us eternal life. Those who believe on Jesus are the children of God. So, you become a child of God once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there is this false idea out there that we are all, that everybody is God's children. And that is not true in any way, shape, or form. The Bible is clear that you become a child of God when you believe the gospel. You're not a child of God until you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're essentially serving the devil, even though you you may not have intention of serving the devil. You just might be out there sinning, not knowing the gospel, not hating God necessarily, but 
not knowing the gospel and not believing on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But those that believe on Jesus are the children of God. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, being Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Galatians 3.26 says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. It couldn't be any clearer than that. Ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. If you don't believe the gospel, you are not a child of God. All the world is not God's children. Only those who believe the gospel. Now, I kind of got in a fight with, you know, not a fight, but a Facebook discussion with somebody about this, and and they got mad at me because I, you know, said that basically you're not a child of God until you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this person got mad at me and said, we're all children of God. Well, it's not true. You're not a child of God if you don't believe, if you don't have your trust in Jesus Christ, because we are adopted into the family of God when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, when we're born again into the family of God. Some may ask then, what, well, obviously I hit the wrong letter there, what if someone stops believing? That's a question that is often brought up. What if somebody stops believing? Well, check this out. John 3, 18, I gave this scripture before, but I'll give it again. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. If somebody has truly believed on the name of the only begotten Son, they're not go I don't believe that they're going to stop believing. But even if they did, the Bible doesn't say that they can lose their salvation because they stop believing. It says that they are condemned because they have not believed. So if you're condemned to hell, it's because you have not believed, not because you believed and stopped believing. But I don't personally believe that anybody that is a true saved Christian is ever going to stop believing the gospel. Somebody who truly has put their trust in Jesus Christ, I don't believe that they're ever going to stop believing the gospel. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2.13, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. So even if we don't believe, he cannot deny himself. And if we have believed, he has promised us eternal life, and he cannot lie. Matthew 7, 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So he doesn't say, well, you know, I knew you for a while because you believed for a while and you were a Christian like the Church of Christ believed that you can just lose your salvation over and over again. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. The Bible teaches, Jesus said there, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. They were never saved. So it goes back to John 3.18, that whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So nobody's going to stop believing. But if they did, if they have really, truly, ever, really, truly put their trust in Jesus Christ, God is not going to turn them away because he cannot lie. If they've believed on Jesus Christ, then he is faithful. He cannot lie. He promised eternal life to those who believe, who really, who really commit their trust to him. Now, like I said, I don't believe that person is ever going to stop believing. Call on the Lord. Well, the Bible tells us to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that is part of the salvation process. I know it's kind of weird. It's not a work to call on the name of the Lord Jesus because the Bible says that we're not saved by works, but we're saved by faith. But the Bible does tell us to call on the name of the Lord. Romans chapter 10, verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... 
and shall believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So if you confess with your mouth, and believe in your heart, because Jesus said in another place that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if it's not, if it don't come out your mouth, I'm pretty sure it's not in your heart. We have to confess. It's part of the salvation process to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's what the Bible says. I'm not going to argue with it. The Bible says that man believes unto righteousness, just like it said Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's what the Bible says. I'm not going to argue with it. Verse 11, For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is over all, the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we must call upon the name of the Lord. Let me see what I've got next here. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? If you don't believe, the gospel message that I presented to you tonight, you can't call on the Lord because he won't hear you even if you did some fake call, even if you prayed some fake prayer. He's not going to hear you. But if you believe what I'm saying tonight and you you really are convinced that the gospel is truth, that what I have said to you is true, then call on the name of the Lord and I will help you right now. If you want to pray with me, I will help you call on the name of the Lord. So pray with me after this. Lord Jesus. I am a sinner. I know that the wages of sin is death. And I know that there's a second death which is hell. And Lord, I don't want to go there. I believe what the Bible says, that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe, Lord Jesus, that you died for my sins. And I want to be saved. I want to be in heaven when I die so that I actually never die. Give me salvation, Lord. Have mercy on me. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I know that wasn't the most eloquent prayer that you've ever heard in your life, but if you believed it and you called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, then from this point on, you are a saved person. God will never take away your salvation because the gift of God is eternal life. Jesus said, I give to them eternal life and they shall never perish. If you have believed the gospel message that I presented to you tonight and you prayed that prayer and you meant it, you believe the gospel, then you are a saved person. Welcome to the family of God. That's my message. Now, I would like to invite you to come worship with us at Fatherland Baptist Church in Madison, Tennessee. The Bible exhorts us to be a part of a congregation. Hebrews chapter 10, 23 tells us, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. So don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, and especially as we see the day of Christ approaching. And the day of Christ surely is approaching. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That's what the Bible tells us. The Bible also tells us, And he gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So God gave good gifts to men, and he gave some apostles and prophets. Those are the guys that gave us the scriptures. He, Those are the guys that established the gospel, that established the first churches, and the, the prophets before them that just preached 
preach the word of God as clear as they had it. And they, they didn't even know as much as we know about it. But they preached what they had. They gave us the Bible. And then evangelists are guys who do what I'm doing tonight. They go and preach the gospel to people. They go and minister and tell people about Jesus Christ. Pastors and teachers, you need to be under the authority of a pastor in a church because the Bible tells us that they're given for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the perfecting of the saints so that you can learn how to live a godly life. You can walk with Jesus Christ and learn how to walk a godly walk for the work of the ministry so that you can also minister the gospel to unbelievers and minister to your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the building up of the body of Christ. So find yourself in a King James only preaching Bible believing church somewhere or come visit us at Fatherland Baptist Church in Madison, Tennessee. We would love to have you. Also, if you're watching by Facebook and or YouTube, then do as the kids say and smash the like button. Hit the thumbs up on YouTube and hit the subscribe button and the bell so that you can be notified every time I upload a message like this one. I am R.K. Brown. This is Rightly Dividing the Word with R.K. Brown, and I thank you for watching tonight. God go with you this week. If you believed the gospel message and you were saved, congratulations. You're in the family of God and you will never be cast out. Even if you do wrong, God will chastise you. God will whip you, but he will never cast you out. There's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. Okay? Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm R.K. Brown. This is Rightly Dividing the Word with R.K. Brown. God bless you. I'll see you next week, Lord willing. Good night.